Welcome to Studies with Stearman. Join us as we look deeper into the Bible. Strengthen your faith with us, even as we see the day approaching. And now, here's Gary. We concluded our study in 2 Peter last week with chapter 3, noting that 2 Peter chapter 3 is probably the best statement ever written about the cosmos. Peter concludes his second epistle with a sweeping panorama of creation, literally from first creation to last creation, from the days when there was no cosmos to the days when there will be a new heaven and a new earth. And he concludes with a thought that we must always keep right at the front of our mind. He says in 2 Peter 3.14, Wherefore, beloved, seeing that you look for such things that is, the new heavens, the new earth, the restitution of this universe. Wherefore, he says, seeing that you look for these things, be diligent that you may be found of him in peace without spot and blameless, and account that the long-suffering of our Lord is salvation. In other words, this whole creation motif is for the purpose of salvation. And that salvation is in generic terms. Paul refers to it as restitution. He refers to it as reconciliation. He refers to it as regeneration. Peter calls it salvation. Basically, it's the same thing. It's redemption. This process, regeneration, renewal, restitution, reconciliation, redemption, whatever you want to call it, you are right in the middle of it, and you need to know always that you're right in the middle of it. That is to say, it proceeds as though it depended on you. You can reach out and grab it. Well, Peter concludes this second epistle with a reference to Paul, and that gives us the title of this series. Second Peter 3.16 says, As also in all his epistles, speaking in them of these things, that is, the things of the cosmos, in which are some things hard to be understood. Now there's an understatement. Do you understand particle physics? You know, <laughs> do you, you understand string theory? Do you understand all of the idea of hyperdimensionality? Of course not. Neither do I. Neither do the physicists who write all those thick and heavy books. But the Galilean fisherman writes about it as though he knew it all the time. Lived by the sea there in Capernaum, grew up, started to follow Jesus. And you know about Peter. He was just really not a perfect man, but the Lord made a rock out of him. And Peter writes and he says, I know that what I have written is difficult to understand, and I'm not the only one. Paul has also written things hard to be understood. Peter is viewing the macrocosm. He's viewing this massive idea of changing the universe. And it still boggles my mind that a Galilean fisherman could wrestle with concepts like that. It's just a mind-boggling thing. From the creation to the recreation, beginning with the old world, ending with the new world, the new heavens and the new earth, when the effects of the Luciferian rebellion will be overcome, by the way, that's not just a biblical theme. That's a theme that runs entirely through world society. If you read novels, if you read sci-fi, if you watch movies, and a lot of those are unwatchable, but you get the idea. What you find out is that the popular literary themes of our day reflect exactly what Peter's writing about. Star Wars. What's Star Wars all about? Well, it's about Luke Skywalker, who's kind of a savior, and he's battling against the likes of Darth Vader, who's a type of Lucifer, right? Where'd that idea come from? Right out of the Bible. It's a biblical idea. What about Star Trek with the Romulans, the Klingons, the Saurians, Q, this being called Q, who can show up at any time, and he's a rascally character, almost a type of Satan. Where do these ideas come from? The Bible. You know, you have Stargate, where this super being comes down and opens a gate to another dimension. And where does he come to open that dimension? Well, he comes to Egypt in the Great Pyramid. 
And basically, if you follow the theme of Stargate, this creature who comes down is a model of Osiris, the ancient god of creation, except Osiris is, is simply another name for Lucifer. You can read 2001, A Space Odyssey, which is all about a destroyed universe that is in the process of being rebuilt. Where did that idea come from? Arthur C. Clarke, particle physicist, by the way, worked for NASA for a number of years, wrote that book, 2001, A Space Odyssey. Where did he get his theme? The Bible. Dune, Frank Herbert, classic sci-fi novel. It's all about a ruined universe. It's in the process of being rebuilt. Where did Frank Herbert get that idea? Well, he would deny he got it out of the Bible because he was an atheist, but he did. Stranger in a Strange Land, Robert Heinlein. It's all about a character named Valentine Michael Smith who's born on Mars, and he brings redemption to planet Earth. And he's a lot like Jesus. Well, where did Robert Heinlein get that idea? The Bible. We're talking about the same thing here that Peter's talking about. We live in a place that's in the process of being rebuilt. It's broken. And Peter refers to it as salvation. Account that the long-suffering of our Lord is salvation. And of course, you all know my affinity for the concept of salvation. And by that, I don't mean walking the aisle. Although, that's an important part of salvation, but it's only a part. When I talk about salvation, I think of what Peter and Paul were thinking about, and John. They always thought of salvation as the total rebuilding of the universe, including a special people called out for God's name. Paul, you know, uses that $50 Greek word, apokatalasso, which is translated into English as reconciliation, meaning the changing of one thing into an entirely different thing. That's what we're talking about. That's what Peter is talking about. And today we're going to continue this study by just turning toward the front of the Bible a little bit and going to 1 Peter chapter 1. Peter's first epistle is centered upon giving the faithful a divine perspective concerning the trials of the Christian life. And believe me, the trials of the Christian life are a given. In fact, they are desirable because only through trial can you progressively arrive at a higher and higher spiritual state. So today, having worked our way across the cosmos, we're going to come back to 1 Peter chapter 1. It's all about endurance, but it's about much more than that. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, and let me just say, following that phrase, that both First and Second Peter are academically contested books. You know that back at the Council of Nicaea, Second Peter was questioned as being authentic. And the Nicene Council felt that it should be left out of the Bible. Nevertheless, it was included. But then again, in the Council of Laodicea, about 40 years later, they almost kicked Second Peter out of the Bible again. But by a vote, it was included. First Peter, same thing. There were a lot of people who said this didn't come from Peter, is not written by Peter. It's a forgery of some sort. We need to kick it out of the Bible. But through a series of events, 1 Peter was included in the Bible. And as you read it, I think you'll agree with me that the internal evidence, the intrinsic evidence of 1 Peter makes it very clear that it was written by Peter. It sounds like him. It sounds like what's on his heart. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ to the strangers, scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. Elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father through sanctification of the Spirit unto obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. Grace unto you and peace be multiplied. Peter writes this letter from Babylon. It's interesting if you go right to the end of 1 Peter. That's 1 Peter 5, 13 and 14. In fact, I'll start in verse 12. It says, By Silvanus, that is Silas, a faithful brother unto you, as I suppose I've written briefly, exhorting, testifying that this true grace of God wherein you stand, he's using as his amanuensis Silvanus. Possibly they wrote this letter together. Possibly he dictated it to Silvanus. The fact is, Peter was literate, so he may have written it himself, and it's likely that he did, because the style of the Greek in this letter is colloquial. 
Peter grew up in Capernaum on the Sea of Galilee. And in Capernaum, it's known historically that they spoke Aramaic and Greek in their daily language because Greek was the common language of the land in that day. And so Peter would have been able to write, probably went to Hebrew school, he probably was literate, seems able to write. This letter is written in common Greek and carried by Silvanus or Silas. Verse 13, the church that is at Babylon elected together with you, saluteth you, and so doth Marcus my son. So Peter is in Babylon with Marcus. Now a lot of people have said, well, this Babylon may be a metaphor for Rome, since it's well known that at the end of his life, Peter was in Rome. And in fact, probably spent, say, the last decade of his life in Rome. It's very well known that he was crucified in Rome and buried there. And history has tried to make Peter the father of the Roman church. It's much more likely that Paul is the father of the Roman church. Peter spent most of his time in the East. It's very well known that he was in Babylon. In fact, here's an interesting historical fact. You remember the Babylonian captivity when Nebuchadnezzar came in 606 B.C. and laid siege to Israel? And then in 586 B.C. he destroyed the temple. He took captive the nation Israel. They went back to Babylon and they became his slaves. Later on, under Cyrus, the Jews were allowed to return. But only about 60,000 Jews returned from Babylon during the days of Cyrus. In fact, most of them elected to stay in Babylon. And there was a very huge Babylonian contingent of Jews who remained there all the way up until the time of Christ and beyond, and up until the 20th century, up until the British mandate to San Remo Conference in 1923, which turned Babylon into Iraq. Up until that time, there was a very sizable contingent of Jews living in Babylon. That's where Yitzhak Kaduri was, was raised. Some of the greatest Torah scholars of our age were raised in Babylon, believe it or not. Interesting thought, because a lot of people say Peter wasn't really in Babylon, he was in Rome. No, he was in Babylon. And notice how he addresses his letter, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the strangers, to the strangers scattered throughout Pontus. Guess what the Greek word for strangers is? Diasporas. Does that sound familiar to you? Have you ever heard of the diaspora? That's a Greek word. So Peter is writing to the diaspora, scattered throughout. What do we think of? We think of the diaspora. We think of those scattered because of their faith, in particular, the Jews and Hebrew Christians. So his main audience is Hebrew Christians who are included in the diaspora. And you notice the way he addresses this letter is an intrinsic evidentiary that supports his Babylonian presence because if you tell somebody where you are, like I'm in Oklahoma City, and if I were to mention, what are the cities near Oklahoma City? Somebody might ask me. Well, they, they would be, let's see, El Reno, Hinton, Burns Flat, Clinton, Sayre. Or if I were to mention some cities to the east, I would say, well, let's see, there is a... Mm, Arcadia, you go up Route 66, Stroud. But you see what I'm doing? I'm naming cities progressively farther and farther away. And it's the customary way you do it if you tell somebody where you are. That's exactly what's going on here in the first verse. Because Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia go from east to west, away from Babylon, as though Peter is naming places that are progressively farther and farther away from him. So here we have evidence, not only by his own mouth, back here in chapter 5, but also we have intrinsic, internal evidence here that he is in Babylon. Now, having established all that, let's go into the letter. He addresses the diaspora, and he says, You are elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, through sanctification of the Spirit, unto obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. Now, does that ring a bell with you, those few words? That's the Godhead. 
Elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father. When you pray, to whom do you pray? Well, you pray to God the Father. Our Father, who art in heaven. And by what means are you able to come to the Father? By the finished work of the Son. So you pray to the Father through the Son in the Holy Spirit. Elect according to the knowledge of God the Father through sanctification of the Spirit. The sanctifying action of the Spirit is that which brings us to the Godhead unto obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. Grace unto you. Peace be multiplied. There's a lot of theology in the first two verses of this letter. There's heavy theology here because Peter is, first of all, he's naming his audience. These people are living in the Roman Empire under Nero. They're living in Babylon and hoping that they can stay out of sight when Roman troops show up. They are living kind of an increasingly furtive existence. This is probably around A.D. 63 or 64. This letter is an encouragement to those people living in these conditions. He reminds them, you are called. You have been called. Now, the word elect does not appear in the Greek text. This is fascinating. Elect, eklego in the Greek, means to pick out or to choose. And ordinarily, if you see elect in the English, you'd think, well, it's there in the Greek too. It's not. The Greek text just starts with according, according to the foreknowledge. Kata prognosin, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father. That is something that you really ought to think about. Foreknowledge means that God has seen something before it ever happened. It does not necessarily mean that he has directed everything before it ever happened and caused it to happen that way. It is not to say that he can't, but this word means that he has seen it in advance and that he has chosen people within that scenario to live their lives. In other words, God has deliberately taken each one of you and put you in this environment directly and deliberately where you are in the body you possess. Now, you might wish for a different body or a different mind. You might wish for a different environment, a prettier place to live. You might think, well, I got stuck with the wrong set of parents, and boy, you should see my Aunt Bill and Uncle Flo. Whew, man, God really stuck me in a place. And you stop and think about it. It's very popular to blame everything on your environment. If you get caught with your hand in the till somewhere, chances are at some point down the line you're going to say, man, if you had been in my shoes, you'd have done the same thing. You don't know my dad. You don't know what I grew up with. I'll tell you what. It's just, you know, my mother didn't love me. I was poor. I got kicked out of the house. I was like, man, you never heard such a horrible. I, uh, uh. And why did God stick me in that place anyway? You, you've heard all that before, right? You've heard a million and one recitations of how I would be a much better person if God had put me in a much better place, right? That's called psychiatry. <laughs> you sit down, it's $150 an hour, and you tell your shrink just what it is that you wish were different. And he says, it's all right. But what Peter says is, you are elect, that is, you have been, according to his foreknowledge, placed in this particular environment at this particular time for a particular reason. Ah, that makes it all better. Through sanctification of the Spirit. Not only that, but you have the Spirit unto obedience. In other words, you are able to obey God because you have been sanctified by the Spirit of God and... You are in the position you are because you have been literally sprinkled with the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. And then he says, grace to you and peace. Grace, and I love the salutation that the apostles use. Grace is, 
In other words, God's loving kindness be upon you and peace, shalom. He catches both crowds there, Jews and Gentiles. I really believe that when Jew meets a Jew, it's always shalom, shalom aleichem, aleichem shalom. And when a Greek meets a Greek, Christu, grace be unto you. And then he gets them both right here, Jews and Gentiles. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a living hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Peter never misses an opportunity to talk about the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead because that's so much part of your identity. Jesus came to live in a physical body. He was a physical person who lived a physical life with physical people. He heard the sounds, smelled the smells. He was here. When he died, he died a physical death, a horrible physical death in which he was pierced repeatedly so that all of his blood ran out. That's about as physical as you can get. And when he was resurrected, he was physically resurrected into a physical body and he'll be a physical person forevermore. A living hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled and that fadeth not away reserved in heaven for you. In other words, each of you has that thing which a rich man would pay a hundred million dollars to get hold of. If a rich man had a half a billion dollars, I dare say he'd give about 490 million of it for the promise of eternal life. If he could just get the right Swiss doctors and the right pills, and if he could get somebody to promise eternal life, he'd give just about every penny he had, right? And there are a lot of rich men that are trying to do it. They're, they figure out all kinds of ways to stay alive longer and even having themselves frozen so that they can be unthawed, you know, when uh, medical science reaches a cure for their current disease. I got news for you. Through Jesus, we have eternal life right now, physical eternal life forevermore. Peter calls it an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled. Now that's important to remember because we're not perfect, we human beings. And we're going to get to that as we get a little deeper into 2 Peter here. We have been placed where we are for a reason. And this is the thing that I've got to come back to again and again and again. I have to bring myself back to that all the time. Because my tendency as a human is to say, oh man, oh God, why did you put me where you put me? It would have been so much easier if you had put me over here. As I used to say, laughingly, I wanted to be born the eldest son of the wealthiest jeweler in town. <laughs> and God didn't do it. <laughs> no, he put me where he put me for a very, very good reason. And he put you where he put you for a very good reason. And you have to constantly remind yourself of that because your inheritance is being carved out of the place he put you. And it's not like any other inheritance in the entire universe. You are unique. Look at verse 5. 2 Peter 1.5 is just an amazing thing. He continues to talk to these people who are scattered abroad, and he says, who are kept, you are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. Ready to be revealed in the last time. Notice where it says, you are kept. You are kept by the power of God. I want to tell you something. You cannot live the Christian life. I want to say that again. You cannot live the Christian life. You know what's inside of you. I know what's inside of me. And I'm not going to tell you what's inside of me any more than you would tell me what's inside of you. Right? Are you perfect inside? Mm -mm. We're going to be this way till the day we die. We are imperfect creatures who cannot live the Christian life. But we are kept by the power of God. 
That's a promise. We're kept by the power of God. That's the astonishing promise that Peter wants everybody to know about. We're kept by the power of God. Now, that runs counter to a lot of theology. Now, there, there are entire denominations that teach that if you commit the abominable no-no, that God will kick you out of the heavenly choir, and you may not be able to get back in again, or you may, depending on what you do. I don't believe that at all. I think that if you are safe in Christ and washed by the blood of the Lamb, sanctified by the Spirit, in communion with the Father, that you are kept by the power of God, not by your own power, not by your own inner abilities, not by your own piety or sanctity or goodness, internal goodness. Don't look inside of me for goodness. If you look inside of me, you're going to see some things you probably wouldn't want to see. But look to God, because He's the one who keeps you. Peter says, who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation. There's that term again. Salvation. Salvation is an indefinable word, by the way. Salvation just means being safe in one sense. Salvation, the Greek soterios, being safe. That doesn't really define salvation at all. Salvation is a process. How long is the process? Three score and ten? Is the process as long as you live? No. The process began before the foundation of the world, back when God divided the waters above from the waters below. And it'll end with the new heavens and the new earth. We're talking a long, long time here. But right smack in the middle of it is me, a dust mote in the cosmos. And I live for but a millisecond that long, and then I'm dead. But I'm part of that whole salvation plan of God. And notice that Peter says, salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. What does that mean? It hasn't been revealed now. Does that mean that our salvation has not yet been revealed? Well, yes, that's what that means. Think about it. In other words, where you are today, is that where you're going to be? No. You're in the midst of a divine process. And I come back to what I said a minute ago. The reason we study the Bible is to give us divine perspective on the trials of the Christian life. You've got to keep your perspective. In fact, perspective is more than important. Leonardo da Vinci, who's considered to be a genius, once said, perspective is the bridle and the rudder of interpretation. Now, that's an odd metaphor. It's an odd way to say something. But do you know what a bridle is? Well, you lead a horse along by it. And a rudder, you steer a ship. A bridle is pulling something along. A rudder is turning something. And Da Vinci said, perspective is the bridle and the rudder of interpretation. In other words, you can't properly interpret anything unless you have perspective. You can't interpret the Bible unless you have divine perspective, unless you can back up far enough to see the picture. And then once you see the picture, then little pieces begin to fall into place, and then Last of all, you begin to place yourself into that divine picture, and that's when you begin to change. Bit by bit by little bit, you become remolded until you're like Christ. Well, not really. Not like Christ. Not even remotely. You're approaching Him. You're not going to be like Him. Nevertheless, you're going to be kept. First Peter Chapter 1, verse 5, who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. The revelation of the Lord Jesus Christ is what the whole world is waiting for. Now, even a bunch of you know, rank sinners, they're scared. If you start talking to them about Jesus, they get nervous. Have you ever noticed that? You can talk about physics and chemistry and the city water department and your Uncle Fred, and all kinds of things. But if you mention the name Jesus, <gasps> people start to get just a little nervous. Have you ever noticed that? Because that means the next thing out of your mouth may be something like Jesus saves. Uh-oh, got to go. My time is up. I don't want to hear about that. People are nervous about that. And yet the whole world knows about the second coming. I'm serious. The whole world knows about it. 
Up until about uh, 25 years ago, the New York Times set headlines in great big block type, which was carved out of wood. And those old wood letters were a tradition at the New York Times. There were other processes available, like lead casting, and, and then later on phototypography, where you would shoot a picture, and this goes into a lead mold and, and becomes the mechanism by which the paper is printed. But nevertheless, they retained those great big hand-carved wood block letters as a matter of tradition. So if they had something that was really a big, big, big headline, they could set wood type. And they finally threw those away, I understand, about 25 years ago, where they went totally to computer typography at the New York Times, and they threw away those big wooden letters. And you know what they called those big wooden letters at the New York Times? You know, every type has a name, like there's Bodoni Bold and School Book, you know, and Times New Roman, and on and on and on. The name they gave to those big block headlines was Second Coming Type. They called them Second Coming. And the word at the New York Times was, you only use these big wooden letters when Jesus comes. And so they came to be called second coming type. The whole world knows about Jesus coming. Even the New York Times. Even though they've thrown away that type, they probably still have that on computer. You know, if you went to the New York Times and hit second coming, it would probably pop up that great big bold headline. Salvation is ready to be revealed in the last time. The whole world is waiting in one way or another, either dreading or anticipating the coming of Christ. That the trial of your faith, and here it is, this is the key feature in 1 Peter, that the trial of your faith being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. The trial of your faith, the testing of your faith, being much more precious than of gold that perisheth. Are you willing to have your faith tested? Careful before you answer. Take it seriously. Don't just say yes without thinking about it, because the Lord might actually test your faith. Most Christians and I think I'm correct when I say this. Most Christians want security. They want the kind of security that comes with knowing that you're all paid up with God. You put the right amount of money in the collection plate. You're in good standing with the members of the church. You sing on key when the hymns are sung. You've done your part and you expect God to do his part. And, you know, I've joked about the last in, first out Christians that sit in the back row. Now, this is nothing against you people in the back row, but there's the last in, first out Christian. He parks his car in a strategic spot, whips into the back row so that he can exit first at the end of the service and beat everybody to first cafeteria. But you're not one of those, right? But a lot of people want that out of their Christianity. They want to kind of be comfortable. They want to say, I've paid my part. Now God's going to do his part. And I'm just going to be this way until the day I die. No problems, no sweat. That's not what Peter says. He says that the trial of your faith being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire. And there's some of you in here today that have been tried with fire and are being tried with fire might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ, whom having not seen you love, in whom, though now you see him not, yet believing you rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory, receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation of your souls. We're all waiting for salvation, you know that? We are all waiting for salvation. We are. And that flies in the face of the customary belief that salvation is that which you obtain when you walk the aisle. You've got to get saved, right? Walk that aisle, make that public testimony, and now you're saved, and glory, hallelujah, it's all over. Uh-uh. No, sir. No, ma'am. Not all over. That's the very beginning at that point, God says, all right, good show. Welcome aboard. Hang on tight. 
And be careful what you ask for, because you might get it. You all know what I'm talking about, really. But this is what Peter is talking about. He's giving us divine perspective macrocosmically in 2 Peter. The reason I started with 2 Peter is because of that phrase, things hard to be understood. Salvation is not easy to understand. And if you doubt me, look at the history of Christianity. They've tried everything. I mean, everything from spinning the prayer wheel to you name it. Indulgences, flailing your back so that it bleeds and walking on your knees up a bunch of stairs. I mean, they've tried it all and they've missed it. The end of your faith, not the beginning. Notice that, verse 9. Receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation of your souls. It doesn't even yet appear what I'm going to be. It does not appear what any of you are going to be. You don't have a clue as to what you're going to be. Not a clue. Somebody asked me a question today, what's life going to be like in heaven? And I was asked a specific question about what life's going to be like in heaven. And I said, I don't know, nor can it be found in the Bible. And if you find it, let me know, because I haven't seen it yet. I don't know what we're going to be like in heaven. Do you know what kind of bodies we're going to have? I absolutely not. We have some vague idea because we're going to be like Christ. But what does that mean exactly? We're going to be above the angels. What does that mean? We don't know. The end of our faith is a mystery. And yet we proceed as though we could see everything because we have faith. And salvation begins with being washed in the blood of Christ. It proceeds with sanctification of the Spirit. And it ends with resurrection unto eternal life in a glorified body. I'd love to get my glorified body. I don't have it yet. And what you see before you is anything but glorified. Believe me. I have no idea where I'm going, but boy, I'm going, and I'm going to get there. <laughs> of which salvation, says Peter. Now, you talk about things difficult to be understood. Of which salvation the prophets have inquired and searched diligently, who prophesied of the grace that should come unto you. Searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ which was in them did signify. They didn't know. We're talking about the Old Testament prophets here. They prophesied about the coming of Christ. They prophesied about salvation. They prophesied all kinds of things, and they didn't know. Searching what or in what manner of time the Spirit of Christ which was in them didn't signify when it testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ. Psalm 22, for example, was written as a prophecy of the crucifixion. And the early Jews read it with great curiosity, and they likened it unto Israel. They said that this person suffering here must be Israel. This person suffering must be Israel. Isaiah 53, the suffering servant. Isaiah wrote about that. What did Isaiah know? He knew what the Spirit told him, but Isaiah didn't have a clue as to what that really, really meant. You can go to all the prophets. Daniel is maybe the best example of what I'm talking about here because at the end of Daniel, Daniel asked, what is this? What have you people told me? You know, this angel visited Daniel and Daniel dreamed dreams and saw visions and the angels talked to him and told him what to write down. And at the end, they said, thou, O Daniel, shut up the words, seal the book, even to the time of the end. So Daniel didn't even get to know what his own prophecy was about. He just had to live by faith. And we're talking about 2,600 years ago. If anybody should know, but no, he didn't. And Daniel says in Daniel 12, 8, And I heard, that is what the angel said, but I understood not. Then said I, that is I, Daniel, said, speaking to this angel, O Lord, what shall be the end of these things? And how the angel answer him? The angel says, Go thy way, Daniel, for the words are closed up and sealed until the time of the end. There it is. <laughs> Daniel probably said, mm, I hate it when that happens. <laughs> I'd like to know what this means. And that's what Peter is saying. The salvation process includes everything written in the prophets, from Moses to Malachi, and that's a lot. 
It includes everything that was acted out by John the Baptist and written about by the apostles. And I want you to know that even the apostles didn't know what was going on. Paul says, Jesus is coming. He wrote a letter to Thessalonians and said, one of these days he's going to come down and he's going to descend into the atmosphere with a shout and the dead in Christ shall rise first and those of us who are alive are going to go back to heaven with him. And you know what? When Paul wrote those words, he wrote them as though they could happen at any moment. And Paul expected them to happen at any moment. So 10 years passed, 20, 30, 50, 100. Did it happen? No. Paul died. Peter died. John died. Everybody became very, very discouraged. After John died, Clement of Rome wrote a letter and he said, people, don't lose your faith. Just because Jesus hasn't come just yet doesn't mean he's not going to come. Keep your faith. People were beginning to lose their faith in the coming of Jesus. And this is just about 110 AD. They were losing their faith because Jesus hadn't come yet. Of which salvation the prophets have inquired and searched diligently. Do you read prophecy and search diligently the prophetic word of God? Do you know the date of the rapture? If you do, please come tell me because I'd like to know, but I've never found it. But I still continue to search diligently the words of God. Why? Because I want to stay as close as I can to the divine perspective. I want to see who I am in Christ and where I'm headed to the best of my ability. Verse 11 says, Searching what or in what manner of time the Spirit of Christ which was in them did signify when it testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow. Unto whom it was revealed that not unto themselves but unto us they did minister the things which are now reported unto you by them that have preached the gospel unto you with the Holy Ghost sent down from heaven which things the angels desire to look into. Even the angels are curious about all this. The angels are watching all this and they're looking down and they're saying, wow, did you see what the Lord did in the life of that character down there? Boy, I don't, I don't know about you, but I don't think he really deserves salvation, says one angel to another. Of course, they're looking at my life. I'm not talking about you. I'm talking about me. These two angels sitting up there, they say, I don't think he deserves salvation. And the other angel says, well, the Lord's grace extended into this person's life, and no matter whether he deserved it or not, the Lord gave it to him. And the first angel says, I find that very difficult to believe. And the second angel says, nevertheless, it's true. The angels are grappling with the concept of salvation. And remember now, they were there when Lucifer fell, and he tried to take down the throne of heaven. And many of their brethren in the heavens fell and followed Lucifer, and they saw this disaster take place. And then they saw God create humanity, and they saw humans doing all kinds of wicked and evil things, all the way down through and up to and including the crucifixion of Christ. And these angels are watching all this and saying, what is going on? Why does God not just stomp on these people. But no, God extends His grace to them, and he, he, he extends salvation to them. Can you imagine being an angel and seeing that happen? Wow! And you'd say, God must have some kind of love to be able to do that. God must be a very loving person to do that. Wherefore, verse 13, in other words, in light of all that Peter has just said, gird up the loins of your mind. That's one of those wonderful Hebraisms that is brought into the Greek. And the whole idea of girding up the loins of one's mind have to do with motivation, being alert, being serious, being ready, being continually in a state of strength. Probably the best way to say that. Think about this. Peter has just opened this letter by saying, you have to get a grasp on what this thing called salvation really is all about. Now that you have that grasp, be sober, be prepared, be motivated, and hope to the end for the grace 
that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Hope to the end. Did you ever really read this verse? Hope to the end of what? Now, I want to tell you, Peter and Paul are two different writers. When Paul writes about the coming of Christ, it is invariably about the rapture. To Paul was given a specific ministry concerning the body of Christ. He defines it in the book of Ephesians. He refines the concepts of justification, sanctification, glorification. And he talks about the end of the finite body called the church, which began at Pentecost and will end at the rapture. Peter writes to the diaspora back here in verse 1 where he says, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the strangers, and that's the Greek word diaspora, he's writing to the dispersed. And I want to tell you, I think Peter is writing to the dispersed of Israel who will be alive in the tribulation. You think you read the Bible today? Imagine that you're a Jew alive in the tribulation, and you've got one of those preciously preserved copies of the Holy Scriptures, and you're fleeing for your very life during a time of cataclysm and dictatorship, during which people are trying to kill you, you're going to value the Holy Scriptures like you've never valued the Holy Scriptures, and you're going to read these words of Peter, and he says, you're about to receive the end of your faith, wherefore gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, and hope to the end for the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. The revelation of Jesus Christ. Revelation of Jesus Christ. You know what the Greek word for revelation is? Apocalypsis. At the apocalypse of Jesus Christ, says Peter, gird up the loins of your mind, have your head in the right place, and hope to the end. In other words, to the last possible moment. Jesus said, if those days were not shortened, no flesh would be saved. Nevertheless, those days shall be short. I believe that Peter, of course Peter is writing to us as Christians, bought by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, but Peter is writing to those who will live in the far future, and I don't know how far, who will be under terrible persecution, and who are about to give up. And Peter says, wherefore? Gird up the loins of your mind. Be sober. Hope to the end for the grace that is to be brought unto you at the apocalypse of Jesus Christ. That's where he steps out of the heavens. Every eye shall see him. The tribes of the earth shall mourn. The Jews, the 12 tribes, will realize who it was that their ancestors crucified. It'll be a time of wailing and gnashing of teeth. It'll be a time when the Gentiles will be put to rest once and for all. We are to be, verse 14, as obedient children, not fashioning yourselves according to the former lusts of your ignorance, but as he which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation, living, lifestyle. Because it is written, and it is written in Leviticus 20, verse 7, where the Lord says, Sanctify yourselves, therefore, and be ye holy, for I am the Lord your God. And he says, Be ye holy, for I am holy. And if you call on the Father, who without respect of persons judges according to every man's work, pass the time of your sojourning here in fear. We're pilgrims, we're sojourners, we're travelers. For as much as you know that you are not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain lifestyle received by tradition from your elders, your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and spot, who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world. And there's Peter's perspective again. When Peter looks at things, it's always through a wide-angle lens. He sees from the foundation of the world to the foundation of the new world. That's the way Peter looks at life. And he places everything in that perspective, and so should you when you think about your own salvation. But was manifest in these last times for you who by him do believe in God, that raised him up from the dead and gave him glory, that your faith and hope 
might be in God. Perspective. Do you have it? Do you have divine perspective? It is Peter's deep desire that all those safe in Christ would have divine perspective, would have an intimate working knowledge of who they are in Christ and where they, that is where we fit in this plan of salvation, which began before the foundation of the world and will end in eons future. We're part of that. We're a huge part of that. And we are to see ourselves as part of that.